Let me first announce that I am not a Weber scholar in any sense of the term. Uh, my acquaintance is obviously in course of teaching undergraduate students mainly. Uh, considering that we are reflecting on him, I thought I would focus on something which would be universal in nature. Uh, whoever has read Weber's text must have found out that it is full of empirical references to contemporary Germany and Russia. I'm leaving that out and obviously for shortage of time. My focus will be on what I call his theory of unfreedom. And in fact, in his translations, unfreedom occurs more often than freedom. In Weber's writings, there are at least three metaphorical expressions of unfreedom. Among them I have chosen, which is the least popular, the house of new servitude. It comes from one article on Russia by Weber written in 1906. We are more accustomed with the iron cage. Regarding the translation, there is a dispute and there is a suggestion that it period sell as hard as steel. That is found in the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism written just about the same time and in the same journal. Returning to the article of 1960, there is another metaphor he uses, he calls a new serfdom. I had a feeling that he was possessed with the question of unfreedom, so I chose that I should read up a bit of Max Weber. Thanks to Shobon, I did that, but only very selected texts, including Median Weber's biography. The three metaphors actually point out to Max Weber's understanding and pessimism for perilous confinement of individuals under conditions of modern industrial society variety of capitalism. But he thought that would be universal and true about socialism also. As I expound, I will try to argue that the metaphors actually belong to two genres of Max Weber's understanding. One is scholarly, quote-unquote scientific, and the understanding is put in largely analytical and abstract ways. For example, if you read the Protestant ethics, he talks about teleological efficiency, rational calculation and control as sources of inescapable confinement, which leads to, once again it is common knowledge to us, to disenchantment. Disenchantment is a condition where our spiritual, aesthetic, emotional being is replaced by the cold, hard, mindless logic of formal rationality. Though it is analytical, it was not 
entirely without any empirical reference, the reference will occur later. In 1960 article, political articles, the explanation is patently materialistic. And if I may put it in a single word, quoting Max Weber, he was actually hating what he called material goods inexorable power over the lives of men. That's about the metaphorical expressions. And the renderings are all focused on capitalism. I found an analog in Marx's class struggles in France, 1848-1850, published in 1850, and Grundrisse, Outlines of the Critique of Political Economy, published in 1858. To me, it appeared to be very strange that two authors were writing at two levels at the same time without losing their focus. They had a focus on three things. One is the ethics of existence, the other is human dignity, and other is an irony of history. For the irony of history, I'll read a bit from Max Weber's, and he wrote, as men seek to enhance their freedom by making life more predictable, they unwittingly create structures that gain an autonomy for themselves and begin to constrain human freedom. That preoccupied Max Weber throughout his life. If I've chosen his political essays rather than scholarly essays, my defense is this. Number one, despite his projected value of freedom, he was actually more driven by value relevance, and that is found more in his political essays. And he was categorical that sociology must play a role in exposing public policy and state practices, but without losing on objectivity. These articles were also unconstrained by the imperative of scholarly engagement. Let us say like this particular proceeding right now. More so, in these articles, we can reach out to the real man and his predispositions. The real man is on the screen. About the real man and the predispositions, I like to read a bit from Marian Weber, his wife. The researcher and the politician had fructified each other. The principles guiding Weber in his selection of material towards understanding of the political and social problems of his own time were first and foremost political passion, then a sense of justice for manual workers, and further the conviction that human happiness was not that important thing, but the freedom and human dignity were the ultimate and the highest values whose realization should be made possible for everyone. That was from Marian Weber. And unlike what you do in the classroom, there was no actually discontinuity between Weber the politician and the Weber the scholar. And again, like Marx. Uh, I'm leaving out the specific reference to Germany and Russia, as I have told you, but I shouldn't have. I shouldn't have because Max Weber, 
Max Weber wrote, after long experience, I am convinced that the individual can only come to know what his own will really is through testing his supposed ultimate convictions by his attitude to thoroughly specific problems in which the issues are sharply accentuated. We all know that he has this particular preoccupation with sharp accentuation that led him ultimately to the formulation of the ideal type. As part of this theory of unfreedom, I picked up a subtext on the working class. Up to now, I have located only one paper which deals with Weber's ideas on the working class by Eric Olin Wright, and that is very unsympathetic. I'll try to argue that maybe he deserved a little more sympathy. The attention was to what he called the potato-eating proletariat, and for whom Weber had complete moral and political concern. This is surprising. For a self-confessed, self-conscious bourgeois and a pronounced critic of socialism. But then we must recall that what bourgeois, sorry, what Weber had as his commitment to bourgeois value were not unlike what we normally think to be the bourgeois value. They were three. One, devotion to work as a calling, that is an end in itself. Two, an ascetic outlook, that is, material consumption must be avoided. And three, his individualism. He thought that all these three bourgeois values were under threat from capitalism in its growth, in its wake, bureaucracy, state stifling the individual, the comfort of the ranger existence, and relentless pursuit of material goods. If he was a bourgeois, he was evidently bourgeois of a different order. He was a critique of socialism, And he didn't convert to socialism, but I will quote and show that according to Marian Weber, he came close to becoming a member of the Socialist Party, which is unlike what you teach in the classroom. He didn't like socialism for a number of reasons. And Maybe the diehard Marxist and the communist would hate him for that. But I have a feeling that the current developments, particularly in critical assessment of Soviet and East European socialism, many of the criticisms we make were actually adumbrated by Max Weber himself. Number one, a command economy. Number two, the inevitable loss of the freedom of the masses and the individual. But despite his skepticism about socialism, he had his sympathies for the working class throughout his writing. Some would even argue, and he would be correct, that if one would judge in the light of the total corpus of his writings, whatever he wrote on the working class, it was minuscule, much too small, and probably to be overlooked. If somebody would argue in this particular way, 
for him i have something from median weber once again she wrote about her husband so many things came to him out of this store house of his mind once the mass of ideas was in motion that many times they could not be readily forced into a lucid sentence structure and he wants he wants to be done with quickly and be brief at the top of that because ever new problems of reality crowd in upon him what a limitation of discursive thought that it does not permit the simultaneous expression of several lines of thought which belong together after all let the reader take as much trouble with these matters as he had done himself i am trying to follow what median requested us to do why i am interested in his theory of freedom and now i mean how do i defend that we need to retrieve marginal notes in weber so that we can understand our own times towards this i have this to offer one that sociology today has taken what is called a humanist turn it began from the 1970s and it is about the resurgence of visions of good society but more so it is turning away from positivism's amoralizing practice of sociology kind of a counter culture in terms of alternative social forms i had a chance to read zimmel and in zimmel's writings also uh, there are reflections on the possibility of alternative money and if i read them together uh, they had not only visions of good society but they are also thinking about the alternative forms and this is the new turn in sociology and in the social sciences which began in the 1970s second there is the emergence of what is called humanitarian reason which calls for new ethics and governance with a particular attention to suffering and misfortune this is towards a new moral economy and this is subsequent to the current crisis of capitalism third there is also what you call or what i may call contemporary thoughts on socialist renewal where also there is a humanistic turn in socialist thinking finally and what normally irritates some people somehow weber was anticipating what today we would call postmodern sensibility it calls for an interpreting accounting of the present times drawing on various standpoint sociologies that is not on a monolithic sociology in which the interpretive accounts are modest in truth claims and critically self reflexive this is about a new kind of openness and an urgency to take a look not only in the conditions of social sciences and humanities but also in our state of living but all this began in 1880s within the folds of sociology and those who look for the heritage they look for almost everybody but they found that weber was denied a place maybe they were stonewalled by his position on value freedom 
in my humble way, I'll try to show that Weber had as much claim to be the father of this particular human star. We now turn to Weber's what he called materialistic explanation of unfreedom. What I will do, I will read from both the Protestant ethics, from his political articles and from his speeches. The article I am referring to repeatedly is called The Outlook for Bourgeois Democracy in Russia. It was triggered by the uh, revolution against Tsar Nicholas II, 1905-1906, in which, interestingly, the workers and the peasants played a leading role. What did he write? Max Weber in the Protestant Ethics. I am following a chronology in his writings so that I may not lose out on the sequence in his thoughts. He wrote, in Baxter's view, Baxter was actually an English Puritan church leader. The care for external goods should only lie on the shoulders of the saint like a light cloak, cloak which can be thrown aside at any moment, but fate decreed that the cloak should become an iron cage. In the 1906 article, he wrote, the development of material interests points to the fact that everywhere the house is ready for a new servitude. From here I have drawn the title of my paper. It only waits for the tempo of technical economic progress to slow down and for rent to trump over profit, we can refer to our times also. The latter victory, meaning the rent trumping over profit, joined with the exhaustion of the remaining free soil and free market, will make the masses docile. Then man will move into the house of servitude. At the same time, the increasing complexity of the economy and the partial governmentalization of economic activities, the territorial expansion of the population, these processes create ever new work for the clerks and ever new functions and experts in vocational training and administration. The second bit. According to all experience, history relentlessly gives birth to aristocracies and authorities, those who deem it necessary for themselves and for the people may cling to them, if only material conditions and inter-constellations directly or indirectly created by them mattered then every sober reflection would convince us that all economic weather cocks point in the direction of increasing servitude. Everywhere in an industrially organized life, the structures of new serfdom were ready. He was wondering how freedom and democracy in the long run be possible under the conditions of highly developed capitalism, freedom and democracy are only possible where the resolute will of a nation not to allow itself to be ruled like sheep is permanently alive. From there, he develops what is called an explicit paradigm for unfreedom. And his regret was that capitalism has led to charismatic glorification of reason in the process dooming charisma as the vehicle of man's freedom. 
because charisma can be a vehicle of freedom only when men are not merely social products acting within the routines of everyday institutions when you can create free institutions in the face of the economic system as compulsive apparatus rather than as the locus of freedom. He continues to comment, to the extent freedom is available under conditions of developed capitalism, and I found what follows to be very interesting, it is at best a tarrying for loving companionship. Tarrying means waiting. And for the cathartic experience of art as this worldly escape from institutional routines. That could be about the various festivals, about various utshops, this worldly escape from the routines of everyday life. But then he says, both love and this experience of art are the privilege of the property and the educated. It is freedom without equality. This will take me to the subtext of on the working class. But before we move away, we can have a final look at Weber's pessimism about human freedom. I read again from Protestant ethics. No one knows who will live in this cage in the future or whether at the end of this tremendous development entirely new prophets will arise or there will be a great rebirth of old ideas and ideals or this is his pessimism. If neither mechanized petrification embellished with a sort of convulsive self-importance for the last stage of this cultural development it might well be truly said specialists without spirit sensualists without heart this nullity imagines that it has reached a level of civilization never before achieved and obviously what Weber never liked at all. We now turn to the subtext on the working class. And this is based again mainly on Weber's biographical memoir. It is Nisbet's comment on his Marian Weber's biography that it's a biographical memoir. He was born to a liberal father. But from 1857, he began realizing that German liberalism was appropriated by the German bourgeoisie and he wouldn't like it. So he started moving away, moving away to social liberalism. That was around 1887. What did he do? He had the abiding sympathy with proletarian struggle for dignified existence. And then he wanted the state to take care of the weakest class, the metropolitan proletariat. But then warned the state that it must not help the working class bureaucratically, but otherwise. How? By allowing the freedom of trade union activity and particularly freedom of strike. To the contemporary autonomist theories, I think we were probably produced unknowingly a particular stimulus. And he was engaged in actual campaigns against coal magnets because they would deny before the strike would take place the right to strike. And with reference to German law, and Weber was 
unambiguous that the German law itself was immoral and unethical and must be abolished. So he was in favor of the working class and trying to do whatever it would like to be done in their levels of living through their own effort, neither by the state nor by the bureaucracy and nor by a political party. In fact, he hated all such political parties, socialist parties, which had authoritarian temper. He had and a deep relationship in an association called Social Policy Association founded in 1873. That was a group initially formed with senior academics with a commitment to the working class, but it was joined by uh, important people also outside of the academia. And the task was to find out objectively, for example, the impact on industry, on intellect of the worker. And Weber's point was that to study and without losing sight of the rule of objectivity, but at the same time, it is very important to do. What was trying to produce was the arguments for creation of a new moral economy. I read one passage, a part of a passage, which is about what industry under capitalism does. And I had read Henry Lefebvre's books and I found that much before Lefebvre could write, he was already writing it. The individual in productive activity is shorn of his natural rhythm as determined by the structure of his organism. His psychophysical apparatus is attuned to a new rhythm through methodical specialization of separately functioning muscles and an optimal economy of forces in established corresponding to the conditions of work. I mean, in terms of Lefebvre's writing, this is how you are placed into a different rhythm and not the rhythm of the nature, not the rhythm of the body, but the rhythm of the imperatives of production. And that would be the delegation of the humankind. And the workers were miserable. Uh, we all know that uh, Hegel's students, sorry, Max Weber's students collected the lectures delivered by him towards the end of his life it came out in the form of a book, General Economic History. And almost the last two paragraphs of that particular book, in which Weber talks about what was happening to the industrial working class, I'd like to read. The development of the concept of calling quickly gave to the modern entrepreneur a fabulously clear conscience and also industrious workers, not industrial. He gave to his employees as the wages of ascetic devotion to the calling and of cooperation in his ruthless exploitation of them through capitalism, the prospect of eternal salvation. That prospect was provided by ascetic religiosity peculiar to Calvinism, but it is very interesting that Weber wrote categorically that when ascetic religiosity was dominant, even then workers were ruthlessly exploited. Finally, when this consolation, the promise of eternal happiness fell away it was inevitable that strains and stresses should appear in economic society, which since then have grown so rapidly. He didn't have the chance to examine capitalism which followed. We had, and 
I have the feeling that substantively we were apprehended the every pathological development possibly to which we are witnessing right now. He wanted to be a socialist. And you'll be surprised to know what he wrote. He wrote, one could be an honest socialist just like a Christian only if one was ready to share the way of life of the unprofited. And in any case, if one was ready to forego a cultured existence based upon their work. The argument is simple, that if we are leading a cultured existence, it is on the basis of the surplus extracted from the working class. I mean, I read and once again I thank Shobhan that why we should suffer from a binary of Marx and Weber and say Marx would be the only thinker, philosopher talking for the working class and not Weber. Probably we have done injustice. He wanted to join Socialist Party. And this is what Median wrote. His sickness stood in the way. We all probably know that right from birth, Max Weber suffered from bouts of illness. He had to go to asylum. And there are stories also that if a cat would produce noise too much, he would fly into a rage. Even then, you know, his wife recalls that he would be found staring as if in a void, muttering, thinking, maybe about the conditions of existence. We now return to his unfreedom again to the first part. How did he define freedom? In many ways. But what was essential freedom for him? This. The capacity not to let life run on a natural event, but to treat it as a series of ultimate decisions in which the soul chooses the means of its own existence that would enable somebody to make deliberate, morally responsible, informed choices between alternative values which bear upon public issues. And that was under threat from bureaucracy, from emotional fanaticism, from cynical sophistication, and from blase smugness. And we were did not like any of this. So, he was actually the protagonist of a humanist and cultural liberalism rather than economic liberalism. And he was very uneasy with the decline of the cultivated man as a well-rounded personality and the rise of the expert and with it the decline of freedom. Broadly, his pessimism about political and economic freedom is supplemented by his pessimism about the realms of art, cultivation, and the personality types possible for contemporary men. My last notes, I'm ahead in my time. I'll complete a little earlier. So if you have questions, you can shape up. Almost in the last paragraph of the Protestant ethics, he unfolds what he should do after writing the Protestant ethics. He didn't have a chance to. Among many things, within five, six lines, and this caught my eye. He wrote that I should proceed to find out the relationship of ascetic rationalism to humanistic rationalism. On ascetic rationalism stood 
obviously the spirit of capitalism, but he was not happy with it. He would try to return to humanistic rationalism. What did he mean? He meant the humanism of Renaissance and the Enlightenment. And what was that? Both cherished the virtues like understanding, benevolence, compassion, mercy, and prudence. It called for a conscientious review of history as well as utopian visions of better future. He was the possessor of the humanitas who must engage also in an active life of public service. What is much more interesting that we were liked and wanted to bring back the secular core of the humanities. And what was that? A belief that human beings are capable of being ethical and moral without religion or a god. Fundamental to the concept of secular humanism is the strongly held viewpoint that ideology be it religious or political, must be thoroughly examined by each individual and not simply accepted or rejected on faith. My first time. I do not know. This is one problem you have when you have a normal honors class. I can manage my time better or when I know my audience. I always panic, even now, at the age of 70, talking to a quote-unquote unknown audience. So, could I convince something that we need to take a look back in waiver? And this is a series on German contribution to social science. I have no idea if Shobhan has a plan, given a chance, I would give him the plan. The plan would be that if the lectures began on with Kant and if it ends with X, then could he arrange all the speakers, all the viewpoints, now to reflect on the totality of the German contribution to social science between Kant and with whoever Shobhan chooses to stop, that probably would be giving us an aggregative view because they all feed into one another. That, if it is possible to do, I think this should be done. So? So you are not free to but I, I have almost like applying for an anticipated bill announced that I am not a waiver expert. <laughs> you can raise your questions in English, in Bengali, as you wish. It's a very informal kind of session. You can even help me. Actually, I am not also a waiver expert, but I should at the very outset, uh, I would like to, uh, at the very outset, I would like to thank Professor Pushant uh, uh, for a uh, uh, for his revisionist, in a sense, revisionist uh, reading of Weber and opening up many possibilities uh, of reading Weber in different lines. Some of the things that he hinted at that the Weber can be re read 
uh, from a postmodern sensibility that we, if he categorically argued with the help of text that we were at abiding sympathy from the proletarian struggles, but he was against socialist parties. So this reminds me of the Italian debate that regarding the Gramsci's position that the Gramsci was also very critical of the the Diden dominant parties and trade union politics, but he was uh, opting for a different kind of working class uh, politics like the factory council, where the liberty of the working class or the individuality of the working class is important and regarding their freedom, regarding their assertions. So after listening to Sir's lecture, I think that there is a possibility of uh, reading Gramsci not in the wavering light, but the wavering insights are very important in extending the reading of Gramsci in a different light. But one thing that I would like to point out that uh, because I think that the wavering reading of capitalism is a modernist reading uh, and a particularly non-Western societies, uh, uh, how the reading of Kahoyder Weber would be helpful in understanding the um, in understanding capitalism in a non-Western society because Weber's position was a secular position, but we know that many things got mixed up the secular and the non-secular. Uh, in the genesis of capitalism in non-Western society. So I am very interested to know Sir's reflection on this question, how the Weberian reading, particularly the Protestant reading and the spirit of capitalism, how it helps us or how it acts as a hindrance in reading capitalism in the non-West. I mean, explaining the roots of capitalism in waste, it was actually mixed up. And we normally have two kinds of texts. One is the Protestant ethics and uh, the general economic history. And the renderings are different. And Weber wrote almost uh, as a marginal observation, but I'm very fond of the observation that how the invention of ink and ink pot was also a help to growth of capitalism because that made capital accounting possible. Hmm? And you know, if you if you read Weber and plot what are the factors which made capitalism possible, spirit or embodied, then there are major things like let's say Calvinism as well as the ink pot. So it is always a mixed up story. And about the peripheral countries like ours and Shobhan actually had an interest and Shobhan was telling me that he wrote about the non west also and if somebody could talk on that. But uh, I didn't write on that particular line. But then I, once again it will be something of that particular order. But I don't think that I can um, give you a better answer. Sir, hmm. can you Go उट about the limits of bureaucracy and the exposition is based in say David Bittam's book where there is a whole section on that. So he was very critical of bureaucracy but then he thought that it is impossible to run modern society without bureaucracy either. That is the irony of history. And uh, we, we think that it will enhance my freedom, but then at the end it actually constrains my freedom. And th this is almost inevitable. And there is this note of inevitability as in Marx also in Weber. 
that it is bound to happen. He thought that the best way to deal would be to actually remain exceptionally sensitive to every possible loss of freedom and do something about it, including criticize public policy, what he was exactly doing. So he was asking for very authentic democracy and which is alive always. That would be the only way you can constrain the uh, dehumanizing consequences of the modern order. ঘটনার বই আছে অন ওয়েবার তাতে তিনি তিনটে মেন স্ট্র্যান্ড অফ লুকিং অ্যাট ওয়েবার বলেছেন তারপরে গ্রেন্থার রথ ছিলেন সবচেয়ে সিম্প্যাথেটিক ডেভিড ভিটাম যিনি তার পলিটিক্সটা ব্রিং আউট করেছেন আর এই সোর্সগুলো লাইক মেরিয়ান ওয়েবার সামহাউ আপ টিল নাও আমার ধারণা যে ওয়েবার স্কলারশিপ রেস্ট মেনলি অন দিস থ্রি সোর্সেস আই ওয়াজ ট্রাইং টু কম্বাইন অ্যান্ড ডিকম্বাইন দেন আই স্ট্যান্ড কালেক্টেড অন হিউম্যানিজম said but it's very interesting that when you have nicely argued that about about Weber's critic of experts and bureaucracy so do you like to connect somehow that uh, the focus critic of the bureaucracy experts rule of experts so can we argue that the prehistory of Foucault's critic can be somehow be connected with Weber's critic maybe the, in a from the form is marginal notes. I think it can be connected. It can be connected. But if you examine the history of the growth of ideas, something, let us say, becomes a part of the blood. For example, the criticism of modernity. So whoever comes later, I think knowingly or unknowingly absorbs a part of it. So one can always say, that photo can be traced back to Weber, whether he did Weber or he didn't date Weber, that way. I will agree with your suggestion. Shoban? Any, any others? Yes. Yeah. My question will be a little beside the mark, mm. because the topic has not touched your discourse so far. Still, I want to ask the question, what was Max Weber's position regarding Asiatic mode of production? Thanks. I don't think I can answer the question. Weber, so on? I don't think so. Mm-hmm. No, not, 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 not this uh, epithet. Asiatic mode of production. Uh, you search for that in Weber. 
I think it's stupid. Okay, okay. Our people reflection is that no. Not that. Actor problem is that whoever is the shows to see that generally that he is doing something that they are doing. It's not a problem. It's not an idea. It's not a concept. It's not a issue. I mean, the biography film is a question. ठीक ब्रडेन कर लिखते हैं तो मैं हिसेब निशेष करते हैं से हिसेब निकेशा जो रेकर्डिंग कैपिटल अकाउंटिंग बोली जेटा पिक्यूलियर टू रैशनल कैपिटलिजम से कैपिटल अकाउंटिंग रईटिंग डिवाइसगुलो सहाज्य कर मैं क्यों उन्नी डिसप्यूट करबे ना जो कल आगे आविष्कृत है व्यवहार है क्योंकि अर्गानिक कन्ट्रीब्यूट कर In case of pencil, you can erase it. In case of pink, indelible. That is the way. So it is solidly embedded. That's what is meant. Possibly. Hmm. Possibly. No, that is the character of ink. <laughs> ink remains. Now he is raising a factual question because writing and writing with ink came much before. Why? Why should that be taken as? No, an something might be there before, but when it is being used for what purpose? That is most important. Right. Accountancy, um, say Sombart's accountancy written in ink, combat combine Sombart with ink. Think of it. Capitalism becomes highly solid. Look, nobody is going into kind of a monocultural explanation, and nobody is arguing that that ink and the ink pot made capitalism possible. But since capital accounting would be vital to risk bearing and entrepreneurship, that particular record could be codified through writing, and in that way, ink and the ink pot played a critical part. Documentation. Documentation. Mm -hmm. uh, Prashant, I am virtually illiterate in Max Weber, so I was immensely benefited. And I have one question: that how did he view the scientific revolution? Did he make any comments or any assessment of what you call the uh, Newtonian revolution or the scientific revolution? Did he have any views on that? I don't recall. रेवल्यूशनोस I do not know. Shobhan is saying that there are so many of his writings are still not translated, and um, not at all. If there were certain sharp observations, it should have been translated by this time. Um, but it isn't so. आलोचना 
humanism, renaissance, AJ Kothagulu, the things that he's seeing, that shows that Weber actually belongs to a tradition in uh, German intellectual tradition. You know, in German intellectual tradition, there were two very basic trends. One was this enlightenment, humanism, emphasis on, on autonomy, consciousness, that typical Kant, Hegel, enlightenment tradition. The other was the kind of tradition that you are highlighting. That is a, a different tradition. But, but that was not the, the dominant tradition in German philosophy. That is the emphasis on, say, science, empiricism, AI tradition. এখন ওয়েবার কিন্তু হচ্ছেন একেবারে ওই ট্র্যাডিশন ওই ঘরানার লোক মানে ওই কান্ট নিউ কান্টিয়ান ওই যেভাবে তাকে বলা হয় ধরুন এই ওয়েবারের ছাত্র ছিলেন লুকাস হুম তো এরা হচ্ছে সব ওই ঘরানার লোক আর একেবারে উল্টো দিকের যে ট্র্যাডিশনটা যেটা পরবর্তীকালে ধরুন এই পপার তারপরে ধরুন ডমাসকুন এই এই ভেনা সার্কেলটা এরা যেখানটা চলে গেলেন আর কি এরা কিন্তু হচ্ছেন ওই মানে অনেকটা আমাদের ব্রিটিশ অ্যানালজিক্যাল ট্রেডিশনের সঙ্গে যেটা কিছুটা লিঙ্ক আপ করে তারা কোনো দিনই কিন্তু এইগুলো নিয়ে খুব একটা মাথা ঘামাননি সেই জন্য ওয়েবারকে বোধ হয় বুঝতে গেলে আমার ধারণা যে ওই ওই এনলাইটেনমেন্ট ট্রেডিশনের যেটা অভিজিৎদাও যেটা বলছেন মানে ওর কিন্তু কনসার্নটা ছিল ওই দিকে ওই সাবজেক্টিভিটি কনসিয়াসনেস হ্যান ত্যান ওই যে কারণ আপনি আপনি ওয়েবার মার্কসকে আপনি যতটা রিলেট করতে পারবেন ওয়েবারের সঙ্গে কিন্তু অন্য নিশ্চয়ই ওয়েবারের মধ্যে একটা ফোকাস অন এম্পিরিসিজম ওয়াজ ভেরি মাচ দেয়ার কিন্তু মানে সরাসরি ওই নিউটোনিয়ান ডারউইনিয়ান ওই ওই দিকটা বোধ হয় মানে ঠিক এম্পেরিসিস ট্রেডিশনের ওর মধ্যে বোধ হয় বাট ইট ইস বিয়ন্ড মাই ক্যাপাসিটি টু হ্যান্ডেল আইনস্টাইন ওয়াজ নট ভেরি ফার অফ ইউ সি ওয়েবার ডায়ার ইন নাইনটিন and he was writing voluminously in the beginning of the 20th century coincides with uh, einstein's time in a way very productive time right now is there anything um, no you know german so you handle it <laughs> uh, but is the question legitimate because it, Einstein was not at all far off. Does it satisfy you? No, it doesn't satisfy me, but it doesn't extend my ওয়েবার কিন্তু আমার মনে হয় একটা খুব সিস্টেমেটিক্যালি ওই ঘরানার মধ্যে বোধ হয় ওয়েবারকে না ফেললে আমরা আমার তো তাই মনে হয় that of course and a very poignant thing she wrote in that actually the discovery of bureaucratic ethos and practices and domination submission in science that was fantastic jeta di apni kai tar dhorun frankfurt school er modhe je problem ne tole chilo tar ইন্ডাস্ট্রিয়াল ক্যাপিটালিজম তৈরি হচ্ছে বিসমার্ক ট্রেডিশন থেকে যার নিজে বের হচ্ছে ফলে তো ওইখানটা আমি জানি না মানে আই উইল বি রং ওই যে মানে জার্মান ট্রেডিশনের মধ্যে ওই যে একটা ব্যাপার ছিল না ওই কান্টে কনসার্ন ফর অটোনমি ফ্রিডম সাবজেক্টিভিটি ওইটা কোথাও কে সব সময় ওই ওইখান থেকে ওই যে সায়েন্সেস অফ ইনিশিয়েটিভ মানে এগুলো কোথাও রিলেট করে হুম আর একটা সঙ্গে একটা রিলেট করে 
Uh, as a matter of fact, one source of armed freedom can be understood by reading science as a vocation. You can't avoid it, yet you become unfree. And you can't avoid subordination to a master. That is unfree. So another kind of servitude, he located in science as a vocation. That is a fantastic essay. Um, it contains so many potentials, layers to be unearthed and understood anew. Part of the echo you will find in C.W. Mills, uh, the sociological imagination towards the end of the book. Last year. Yeah. <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> And you warn about the invocation of bureaucratic ethos in research, although that is what we practice. Frankfurt School is very important to me. I said, 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 I your introduction midway. Now, just to clarify, did Weber include art as an unfreedom, as something of the, only of, of the propertied Property uh, class? class. Um, and that is from the Western uh, perspective. Right. Yeah. I, I just wanted to um, clarify that and if you could perhaps elaborate uh, a little bit more on it um, briefly as to why he considered it is did he consider art to be of because of its um, connection with uh, religion church um, patrons not, not that way I mean I mean the, the, the beat I have quoted mm -hmm. it suggests that in order to enjoy art mm -hmm. And in a market economy, then you must have the necessary resources to do so. And if you go back to uh, his theory of class, uh, one category of class he calls the acquisitive class, which can buy life chances in the market, and that would include art or access to art. I think that he had in mind, and. Hence, he argued that since the property less wouldn't have the uh, money to actually enjoy that particular aesthetic life, it will remain always uh, the advantage of the privileged and the powerful and the rich. But then on the other hand, you could stretch that as to, I mean, aesthetics is a very wide... I know. <laughs> One second to interrupt, maybe he had in mind basically the, the commercialist uh, art and for which you need to have money because you can always argue back there would be the enormous realm of folk art for example right. Right? and where probably the, the poorer people or the ordinary people would have easy access to but then that would be unmediated by any money or market mm? that would be kind of a commons cultural commons from which uh, the property list could easily drop and you know 
the non-property class mm. also had um, forms of art expression. Obviously. And I, I was also wondering, um, in relation to, to this, his uh, writings on non-Western societies. Yes. Mm. What, uh, what did he think of, where did he, was art and non-freedom there too? Or uh, culture, I think you also said culture he considered to be an unfreedom. See, I mean, whatever you wrote about the world beyond Western or Occident, that came mainly through his writings on religion, world religions. And uh, as he wrote Sociology of Hinduism, he has made a confession that he didn't have any direct access to the Hindu scriptures, and he depended on Max Muller's translations, and he was rather apologetic about it also. And you may not remember, but we had a very interesting uh, meeting once upon a time in my gallery. Yes. A long time ago. Long time, yes, yes. And that is one of the reasons why I have come Shima. to this. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was a, it's, uh, a confrontation, a story I have told many people. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Is there any other question? আপনার প্রশ্নের উত্তর আমি দিতে পারলাম না আমি স্ক্যান করছিলাম যে যতভাবে পেরেছি টু ফাইন্ড এ কমপ্লিট লিস্ট অফ ইস রাইটিংস তাতে কিন্তু আপনি যে প্রশ্ন তুলছেন তিনি টাচ আপ অন করেছেন বলে আমার কখনো কিন্তু মনে হয়নি বুঝতে পেরেছেন বাট হি ওয়াজ ওয়েল অ্যাওয়ার অফ দি কালচার অফ দিস ন্যাচারাল সায়েন্সেস যেহেতু ডিবেট করতেন অবজেকটিভিটি নিয়ে ইত্যাদি দিনে তিনি থাকবেনই কিন্তু আলাদা করে কিন্তু কখনো মনোনিবেশ করতে পারেননি বা করেননি বলে আমার ধারণা তাই আমি একটু ওনার হয়ে একটু বলি সেটা হচ্ছে ডিন কনসিডার বললে বা একটু মনে হয় যে কনসিয়াসলি তিনি বাদ দিলেন এখন আমরা প্রত্যেকে আমাদের যেটুকু লঞ্জিভিটি এবং আমাদের যে সময় এবং পরিস্থিতির সীমাবদ্ধতা তার ভিতরে যদি উই আর লেট টু সার্টেন কোয়েশ্চেন্স ইট ডাজন মিন দ্যাট উই আর অবলিভিয়াস অফ আদার কোয়েশ্চেন্স এখানে কোনো রকম প্রায়োরিটি করি না এসে যায় আর কি সময়টাকে হ্যান্ডেল করতে করতে এরকম আর অসুস্থ মানুষ যিনি পলিটিক্স করছেন যিনি পাওয়ারফুল লোকের সঙ্গে লড়াই করছেন পলিটিক্যালি যিনি জার্নালে লিখছেন যিনি স্কলারি লেখা লিখছেন যিনি বিদেশে পড়াতে যাচ্ছেন তা হেড রেঞ্জ অফ অ্যাক্টিভিটিস এখন তার ভেতরে যদি যেগুলো এসছে সেগুলো এসছে প্রবাবলি ইট ডাজন মিন যে হি ওয়াজ কনসিয়াসলি সার্টিং আউট সামথিং বিকজ ইট ডিডেন্ট থিঙ্ক ইট টু বি ইম্পর্টেন্ট এনাফ 